right, welcome to Guy's Garage. I'm Guy Andrews, and this is a show about everything that guys love. Today's guest is brought to us by ASN, Australian Sports Nutrition. He's a, well, he has a diploma in chemistry. He is a naturopath. Mm-hmm. He's probably the smartest guy I've known. <laughs> you don't know many guys, do you? <laughs> Steve and Eddie, give it up for Steve. Thanks hey. for coming on, Steve. Oh, it's great to be here. I love this stuff. Mate, I've been really excited about having a conversation with you I've had lots we've had lots of mm. conversations over the last 25 years 25 about, we're that yeah. old I know oh, let's not mention it <laughs> um, so your 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 spe- why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and your specialty and what you're doing right now sure I started off life as a chemist as you said did a double major chemistry physics then went studied naturopathy oh no six years professional muso then studied naturopathy got to get that in yes. uh, then did a, a bachelor of complementary medicine and then a master of health science taught naturopathy for 10 years um, and now work for ATP Science, and we do uh, wonderful products there, which is just great to help people live happier, healthier lives. Well, I was in, I went into ASN yesterday, and I saw the ATP range up on mm. the wall. And so, I mean, one of the big things I wanted to speak to you about, obviously, your background, I and mean, it's amazing. I remember you putting yourself through university busking. Yes, that was thanks a, for that was a bit of a thanks story. Thanks for telling everyone I'm a busker. Quite a good muso. <laughs> quite a good muso. So, I mean, I mean, let's rewind before we, we talk about what you're doing right now. Let's right. let's talk about how, I mean, how does a guy, a muso, a busker, and, and, and your nickname, I always remember you as curly because <laughs> you had long curly hair. And now I'm going bald. Now you're all straight and neat and tidy. Yes. But um, how does a muso, a busker, go, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to, go and do a diploma in, in chemistry well it's a bit weird because you know it, I was always loved to be a muse I learned guitar when I was 16 and 17 to pick up women and I hate to admit that, that that's why I did it oh, and well, yeah, don't, yeah. Don't, 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 I think they do they all do that don't they yeah and then, and then I got I've even tried well you <laughs> play pretty well in fact the last time we were in a studio I believe we were in Brisbane and we we sung Sweet Home Alabama to oh, the people of Brisbane on Triple M if my memory serves wow me. Do you remember that? Yeah, I do. But it comes back to me. Yeah, <laughs> I think I'll probably push the microphone away a little bit and let you take that one. No, oh, look, it was, it, and so you know, like the music is is part was 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 always part of my life. And then you know, I wanted to study naturopathy. There was no fee helps or any of that sort of you know, I right. study thing. I was living alone, so how did I earn money? So what are we looking what? What year is this? Oh, 95, I started studying okay. naturopathy. Before yep. that, I was a professional muso full-time, just to it. And, mm. and I thought, right, time to get a haircut, get a real job. I was in my <laughs> mid-20s. And There's so a song I, in that, isn't there? Yeah. <laughs> There's a song even about my birthday. What do you mean? Summer <laughs> of 69, you know? Well, so, you go, yes. Um, so, you know, we that, that's what got me into it. Of course, it's a great way to earn money. You know, I played at restaurants. I did six nights a week and uh, did seven gigs a week, did two on Saturday nights, Burley Town Tavern, and then went busking straight after that. So It just seems like a, a polar opposite studying chemistry and muso is it it is it is absolutely and and that's what i love about my life now like i i do science during the week and weekends i still do gigs can you believe it you know and i'm 50 you should be over it by now but no we still do the odd gig i know muso i got another good mate out in newcastle i grew up there Mm. um phil he's a you know he still plays now and he's in his 50s i mean look at keith richards i mean he's a He's a vampire, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, he's a dinosaur. <laughs> he's, he's still going. He's, he's, you know, like we, we talk about all the studies, medical studies about what will kill you and he ignores them and just goes yeah, on living. Yeah, well, that kind of leads us nicely into, um, you know, what I want to talk about and what Guy's Garage is about. It's, it's about having fun, but at the mm. same time, we want to sort of shed a bit of light on all these issues that men face. Mm. A lot of stress, a lot of anxiety, mm. modern day pressures, family, you know, you feel like you're that guy that has to keep everything together. Mm. Um, you know, is there some stuff that, we can look at from a dietary point of view, uh, weight loss, healthy aging for guys. You know, hit me with what hit me with some of that wisdom that you always uh, hit me with. All right, well, well, people our age are mostly obese, and this is a big start. You know, about two thirds of us are overweight or obese. So, uh, what's technically you know like overweight versus ob- ob- obese? Like, what's the, sure. where's that line? It comes down to a number, and the number mightn't apply to uh, muscular people like yourself. But if is you're that based on BMI, BMI, yeah. body mass index, which is your weight divided by your height in meters squared. So, if you've got more muscle on, you're going to be a bit higher in BMI. So, exactly. So. Obviously, I, I do a lot of stuff on composition with mm. getting scans and stuff mm. to see what your percentage of fat is. But so, an obese person would there be a you know you talk about the skinny fat? Yes, I think you see someone that's silhouette is quite slim, mm. but their body fat percentage is high. So, I mean, can you explain that? Sure, that that's medically called sarcopenic obesity, and this is you know a big word, but it's sarcopenia means lack of muscle, obesity means too much fat. Mm. So. If you've got not so, let's say you're a typical middle-aged man. My I'm 50. And most 50-year-olds don't go to the gym. I went to the gym this morning. You know, I, I've swim the Savo. You know, I, I exercise. But if you don't, and most don't, let's face it, or don't do it enough, sure. 
they lose muscle mass. And of course, with that, they put on fat mass. So they become skinny fat or sarcopenic obesic. And that's very dangerous for them. So is that a direct correlation? Like if you lose muscle mass, you will put on... Yeah, typically there is a correlation there and a causation because when you lose muscle, the muscle contains things called mitochondria. We won't get too medical here, but basically it keeps your metabolism going. Yep. So as your metabolism drops, you eat the same amount of food and get fatter. So you hear these people say, oh, I've got a slow metabolism. Yeah. Is that they need to part of it. put on some muscle or is there more to it than there that? There is. There's, there's another hormone called thyroid hormone, which is controls your metabolism. Mm-hmm. And that's also controlled by the um, muscle. And what we used to see in, in practice when I was practicing was you'd see people come in and say, I'm overweight because i got a low thyroid. And f- the fact is that usually it's the overweightness that causes a low thyroid. So you always hear that, like, I've, I've got a, a thyroid problem. My, yeah. my smart-ass comment was, well, how many thyroids are you eating? <laughs> you know, like, has it come back to... <laughs> To what we put in our mouths, or is of it? it does. Yeah. Because I mean, I know that sometimes people say, oh, you're over simplifying that. And, um, you know, is there other factors, medical factors that can contribute? I oh, know stress definitely is a contributor. Well, very much so. And it's funny you mentioned stress because stress is an adaptation that, that the thyroid undergoes. If you get a high level of a hormone called cortisol, and we'll call it a stress hormone, if you're stressed, the thyroid hormone goes into a thing called reverse T3. It actually shuts down the thyroid. Because if you're stressed, typically you're running from an animal or you're trying to kill an animal or you're hunting and gathering. And when you're stressed, you don't want metabolism stuff like you know repair. You just want to kill the animal. And then the stress goes away and you go back to living. So is, is our, our genome, our, our heritage, is it that... I mean, we always hear about this hunter-gatherer mm. thing. I mean, that was tens of thousands of millions of years I'm, you know and you can probably help me out here oh, yeah. the um you know i guess our the current generation that we're in you know ad- adaptation we're still we're still hunters and gatherers we but we're living in this fucked up world we are and and genes don't change that readily okay so we are still typically genetically hunters and gatherers and and when we have these stresses in the olden days they were short-lived you either fight or flight you might have heard of for example Mm -hmm. and that was short lived nowadays you can have a a mortgage that goes for 30 years and you could be stressed for years so you've got that that fight stress hormone ongoing day in day out day in day out so this is probably a massive contributor to modern day illnesses absolutely it is I mean cortisol that that hormone now you need it to survive so I don't want to pick on it too much but if you have too much cortisol the way that it works is it makes your body make more sugars so as you can do an anaerobic exercise you know anaerobic exercise when you do that fast sprinting and that sort of thing so you break down your muscle mass to make sugars to get over that stress but if you're doing that day in day out then of course you know you're, you're going to break down muscle and put on fat and that's going to cause that sarcopenic obesity. So how can a, you know, a listener at home, you know, like I've been an athlete my whole life, so there's, I'm not, I don't really, I'm not really targeting athletes because they kind of have a, have a routine, but that, that guy that gets up in the morning, you know, kisses his good kids good, goodbye for the day, goes off to work, he's got mm-hmm. daily stress, he's got pressure there. How does he get healthier feel healthier like with me um you know i'm part of what we're doing is supporting it's a bloke thing foundation mm. which is a great charity raising awareness for prostate cancer um you know my dad passed away in yeah. october as you know mm. last year so six months ago uh, 12 months ago it died from bone cancer which came from his prostate mm. so part of our drive is to get people to you know guys to get their psa levels checked Absolutely. but um now everything that i feel in my body i'm like shit is that, is that cancer? You know, oh. I had a pain under my rib yesterday. Oh, right. But you've had a million of them. And, you, yeah. and when you're a young bloke, you just go, ah, oh, it's nothing. And now, because I've got the family history, then I'm like, oh, maybe I should get that checked or get, you know, yeah. like. So I want to be able to make sure that I can avoid foods that could increase my chance of getting sickness or cancer. Mm. Um, you know, have you got some hot tips for that that guy that's you know in that situation every day he's, he's got the stress in his life mm. to reduce that stress increase his longevity and just feel better mm. yeah the, the, the take-home message for that is to do what your body's designed to do you know i know you're into cars so you would put the right oil in the car you wouldn't put diesel oil in a petrol car sure. I, i'm sure it'll cause problems i don't know much about that but i'm sure it'll cause problems so what we want to do is put the right food and live the right lifestyle in the human body okay mm. So we have to look at what nature's provided for us. Now, we're hunters and gatherers. 
when did we hunt and gather? We hunt and gather first thing in the morning. So the best thing you can do for your body is to get up and exercise. Now we mentioned cortisol before. Cortisol naturally spikes at 6 a.m. in the morning to get you out of bed and to get you to hunt and gather your food. Most people, and I'm, you know, maybe you and I are different, but most people ignore that physiology and just don't you exercise. Yeah, I'm not a morning person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard people say it, and yeah. I, and, and I, I've even heard people tell tried to convince me there are other species of animals to get out of exercise. <laughs> Have you heard anyone called um, night owls? Yeah, 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 night yeah. Owl. I'm a night owl. Yeah, and I'm going, yeah. no, no, you're a human. When yeah, I was in yeah. no, 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 I, I, I know this stuff. Um, so the best thing is to do is to get up and do something. And, it, and the exercise is, is more your domain, what you tell people to do, but some sort of exercise. And then you've got to eat like you're, you're a hunter and gatherer. So you look at that, and that's full of vegetables, fruits, salads, nuts, seeds, legumes, meats, fish, those sorts of things. Typically what we do is we ignore that again and we have, say, a bowl of cereal mm -hmm. with uh, uh, milk. Now let's just think of wheat bix and milk, which is what I used to eat as a kid. And um, milk um, is not designed for humans because it's designed for calves. And just going back to you know prostate cancer, there are hormones in milk that comes from the cow, like IGF-1, we won't go into the details, and other sex hormones which are problematic for humans to consume. And then we put wheat bix on top of that and they've got 69% sugar yep. or 69% carbohydrates that turn into sugar. The food for cancers, we've known this since 1929, is sugar. Mm. So people are having a bowl of cereal and milk for uh, you know breakfast. Feeding themselves the cancer fuel. Yeah, and, that, um, and that, that's not even talking about Fruit Loops or any of the You nasty. once explained to me very simply... You know, people say oh, I'm going to be on a low sugar diet. They go, Oh, I haven't had sugar in in my tea or my coffee for years, and I don't add sugar to anything. But they don't get the the, the difference between carbohydrates and just simple sugars. Can you sure. explain that? To sure. Us? There's two sorts of carbohydrates. There's stuff that's absorbed in the body, and there's stuff that goes through you called fiber. Okay. And there's two sorts of stuff: fiber. Let's just so the stuff that's not absorbed and the stuff that's absorbed. In, um, for example, wheat bix or refined carbohydrates, which is most grains are refined. You don't eat a whole grain, you chip your tooth typically. So they're typically refined, they're in a box, they're refined for you. About 60% of that is absorbed and all of that carbohydrate turns into sugar, right. glucose specifically. And therefore, if you're having a bowl of, say, pasta, that's 70% sugar. That's a lot of sugar. That's so when mum goes, oh, don't have a drink, don't drink the Coca-Cola, drink mm. drink some water and then puts a bowl of pasta in front of you what's what's actually happening yeah see see they the the, the, the pasta will end up as sugar okay the, the coca-cola is bad for you because it's got a type of sugar called fructose which is high fructose corn syrup which is very dangerous for humans mm. but you know we know coke's bad for us but people pasta is you know that on that edge where people don't know that it's bad for you now you apply the rule that i said before hunter and gatherer did you hunt down and kill a bowl of pasta and people go, mm, of course not. And so when I tell my patients, I say, well, that's probably not a food you want to eat all the time. And unfortunately, a lot of people eat those sorts of refined carbohydrates. And they're just so they? accessible. Like you walk into a store and there's Cheap, you know, cereals and you know, fruit roll-ups, which are pure fruit toast sure. and just all this crap. Mm. So um, can you maybe just make break it down into uh, what's a day's worth of food look like for someone that might consume like you're talking about sure okay so so a type of food that, that we'd look at is things like an omelette for breakfast would be a classic one i had that you cut up any sort of vegetables you want capsicums whatever you want with eggs don't put milk in it and that would be a typical easy breakfast you know like the ones apart from pepper and salt that my breakfast has two ingredients sometimes it's just a whole pepper and um, six eggs and that's what i'll eat for breakfast typically so this morning anyway um, for lunch, you may have a big bowl of salad with some sort of protein, nuts and those sorts of things in it, you know, pumpkin salad and all that sort of thing. If you're going to have cheese, feta cheese is a better one, but otherwise just have meat and salad. And then for dinner, you have your meat and veg, whatever that is, mm -hmm. what, you know, whatever that is. Usually fish is good, cold water fish and lots of green leafy vegetables. So talk to me about meat because there's a lot of this, there's so many different diets mm. and different opinions and different moral you know, mm. observations um, aside from the moral side of it, but the health side of it with different types of meats mm. and how often you should have meat sure okay so so let's just talk about red meat um and with red meat there's three major groups there's the processed meats like the the the, the cured meats and that sort of thing avoid those because they're usually preserved with a chemical called nitrates uh, 150 if you want to look on the packet and that's ca a known carcinogen for your stomach bad so then you've got the other two say steaks which is grain fed 
yeah. or um, grass-fed. You might have heard of that yes, sort of thing. Yeah. Now, when you feed grain to a mammal, what happens is the mammal gets those grains, all those sugars, and stores it as a type of saturated fat called palmitic acid. And it, it, what it does is it infiltrates all the tissues throughout the body in mammals and marbles the meat. Have you ever heard of yeah, marbled yeah, meat? You yeah. see it in the marbled you see it. meat, yeah. Yeah, and they're, they're grain-fed. And then what happens then, of course, you cook the steak, it's juicy because all the fat melts. So when you feed grains to a mammal, it, it causes the arteries to clog up with all this fat. So we don't want to eat that sort of meat. We want to eat the grass-fed meat. And just going back to humans... So it's if, kind of the same parallel. Exactly the same. Yeah. You get marbling. And marbling of the, of the arteries in the heart called the coronary arteries is the leading cause of death in Australia for men. Right. Aside from our other topic, which we talked about off off air, which yes. is which is suicide, men were well, one of the leading causes. So, yeah, so I'll, I'll, men, let's yeah. talk about the tie in between mood and depression and and how you eat. Sure. Okay. So, so we, we'll tie that into to any sort of bad foods which stress your body out. Okay. You know, you've you've all been to Macca's and we've, you know, oh, oh, and it, it puts the stress on your body. Stress releases cortisol cortisol is a terrible thing that sucks serotonin out of your brain okay because when is, you, is it the sleep hormone it's the happy hormone yeah right. it's the happy one and you might yeah. have heard of drugs like prozac have you heard of that one yeah yeah prozac increases serotonin in the brain it's called an ssri right. that's the biggest class of antidepressants so that's how they work they increase serotonin in the brain so serotonin is good to relaxing now when you're stressed you don't want to relax because if you're getting chased by a lion you don't want to go ah bugger it it'll be all right yeah you want to be stressed so the cortisol gets rid of serotonin of the brain and stresses you out which is a good thing that's helped us survive 3.5 million years from our australopithecus africanus roots to the homo erectus so let's just say back to that fellow that's getting up and going to work Mm. he wants to have a bit of cortisol in his system to get him up and out the door because i mean i i do it myself i get up and i'm like oh man i'm I'm tired. Yeah. I want to try and, you know, a big day the day before. Yeah. Or, so that's, so how do we naturally increase that? Sure. Well, in the morning, you want cortisol. You want to be pepped up. You want to wake up feeling on top of the world. The way you do this, you train your body to do that. So if you're, you know, struggling in the mornings, try and give yourself a mild stress. The healthiest mild stress, of course, is exercise. Not which just is talking to your wife. <laughs> So I think Beck's going to listen to this. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, uh, not, not for all of us. I'm just generalising here. But yeah. no, it's, yeah, so go on. <laughs> so, her, that, so that stress that you get in the morning is really good if you can go to the gym and do some sort of exercise to mildly stress your body. Yeah. Not two-hour training sessions like you sure. do, you know, but you can you can do a 45-minute gym session. So you, you say like, not, not, not two-hour sessions like you do. So is there a limit, and everyone's limit obviously different depending on their, their current physical fitness level Mm. but how do you judge that that limit you know what's too much yeah it comes down to to personal sort of how you're feeling about it so and how you're coping with the exercise for example many many years ago i mentioned the osteopaths the the older people the older thing we we were hairless apes and with the reason why we're hairless is because we can sweat now so we used to chase down animals all day and it's called persistent hunting and we'd chase them for four hours throughout the middle of the Serengeti and all that sort of stuff in Africa. And because we get sweat, we could outlast the animals. So people right. used to exercise for four to six hours a day chasing yeah. damn animals to kill them. Yeah. So we've got a great capacity for exercise. And, you know, like, you know, people like yourself got even a greater capacity to exercise. But the or human, do we just have a normal capacity? Yeah. Yeah. That, we could call that normal. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and the scary thing is that people typically under-exercise and don't over-exercise. You know, they, they always talk about some person who was a triathlete who died from a heart yeah, attack. Yeah, I always hear your mother-in-law going, oh, you know, so-and-so had a heart attack because he did too much exercise. Mm. And, or Dean Mercer, you know, rest in peace. An amazing oh, yeah. athlete, terrific guy, 48, yeah. sudden heart attack. Everyone sort of, oh, it's because he, he trained too much, he stressed yeah. his heart too much. But, ah. Yeah. Uh, doesn't work like that. The re- firstly, I think he died of a congenital uh, cardiovascular disease, but also, you know, my wife is a cardiac nurse at the hospital on the Gold Coast here, and the people who get wheeled in there day after day are the middle-aged men that are overweight. They're not the endurance athletes. No, they yeah. don't get wheeled in like that. You know, there are cases of people that are having, like, h- h- mitral valve problems and all that sort of thing, but the atherosclerosis, the hardening of the arteries and the clogging of the arteries is what kills you. It's under-exercise is the mm. biggest cause. The most, As I used to say to my patients, and I said it on a a podcast I did yesterday the most dangerous form of exercise is none at all mm. that's by far the danger we know that kills you yep. that couch is a killer yeah I once did a, a training group session I thought oh, I'm going to do a hunter and gatherer session so we just walked um, for a few miles a few kilometres uh, 
just to wake up, just as like we were looking for the hunt. I sort of described it as like, we'll go looking for a hunting ground. Mm. Then when we got there, we did some like low ground sort of stretching, stalking. It was over we stalking the prey, so nice. we were sort of like crawling across the ground and stretching out and getting our bodies moving. And then, then I did a series of really fast sprints, like we were attacking and racing after after the uh, prey. And then we got some um, golf balls and we were throwing some targets in the air and sort of throwing them like we were trying to kill mm. kill mm. something. Mm. Then we loaded up with some kettlebells and carried all the stuff back to the start. It's awesome. And everyone really enjoyed it. And we yeah. actually were, were all buzzing mm. afterwards. It was We worked all these different areas of our bodies and like, yeah, we were sort of like into it. So it was an interesting way to look at a session. That's it. That, that's what you got to do. You've got to go back to doing something that's that's fun and something you'll do. Mm. And, and um, you know, we, we don't want to under-exercise either. If you're going to invest half an hour in exercise – People will say, oh, well, I'll go and do you know, a yoga class or I'll go for a walk. And, that. and that, that's better than nothing. Don't get me wrong. Mm. But you need to, we, when you hunt and gather, you don't power walk after a kangaroo. Yes. You know, yeah. it's a little bit strenuous. You know, yeah. climbing that tree to get that fruit or whatever it is, you mm. know, it's a, you've got to put a little bit of stress on your body. So, you know, keep that cortisol going and, and that's a healthy stress. And, um, you know, looking at the diet of a, of a hunter-gatherer, mm. obviously a lot of, a lot of you know they wouldn't eat red meat or they wouldn't eat meat every day or all the time because it's hard to catch yeah very much so so, so you know in a modern you know if you transfer that to, to today you can just go out and buy whatever you want whenever you want yeah so you know what percentages or what you know how many days should we be eating red you know eating meat and you know how would you yeah. look at it around about look to cut a long story short about two to three times a week for a male and about three to four times a week for a female or, or should i say a female under 50 is what we say because typically they they need twice as much iron which right. is a, a mineral that's found in bread meat not exclusively but it's very rich in those things mm. and if you become iron deficient yep. you don't make these red blood cells and yep. you can't carry oxygen so you feel fatigued all the time yep. that's bad and you obviously don't with that. menstruation and that sort of stuff you they know, lose you it gotta, yeah, yeah, yeah yeah and um uh what about supplements in you know in, yeah, like people talk about like the food that we get sits on the shelf for so long and it doesn't have the same potency that it might be when it's fresh and so can we include supplements is there an area for that i mean i've never been a massive supplement taker mm. the guys at australian sports nutrition the reese brothers that started mm. known asn uh old mates of mine mm. and uh and um you know obviously their business is nutrition but mm. uh, their supplements i've they've given me lots of stuff over the years and i've taken it on and off um i've gotten to 49 now and i'm yeah, you know, I'm reasonably healthy for my age, but I feel like I need something to extra mm. at the moment. So, is there stuff that you would recommend, or you sure? Take? Yeah, I mean, I take uh, supplements every day. I mean, yeah, I work for a company even before that. Yeah. Because a supplement has got to be a supplementing a healthy diet. So it's not called it. Don't don't eat bad and then take a supplement. You think yeah. you're doing all right. So don't go to Macca's like every day and then take yeah. the Barocca and think you're going to be killing <laughs> Barocca too. Yeah. yeah. So so you want to take a natural sort of broad spectrum multivitamin is good we have one called multi-food which is just concentrated so the company you're with now is called atp science yeah it is yeah. and and you know we have one called multi-food and i like that one because it's actually concentrated food and it's got all its right. natural nutrients in it because mm -hmm. you know there, there are some problems with synthetic vitamins you've got to be a little bit cautious of that um we were talking yeah, yes. how do you know what's a synthetic one and what's come, not? come to see someone like me um but but no but just for a typical example a, a classic one we were talking about pregnancy yesterday and a lot of people take uh, folic acid um, before they fall pregnant. Uh, you might have heard of that, yes, I don't know. Yeah, it's, yeah. Um, and that's synthetic um, because right. the one in food is called methyl tetrahydrofolate. Folic acid has to be made into that in the body or you just eat it in your food. Mm. So try and look for supplements that have the natural forms of the vitamins in it. Right. And you can get them, one, you know, once we make it, just concentrated food. So they are completely natural. Mm. Most vitamins, about 95% are made in laboratories, which is, you know... Yeah. And what's your role there at ATP? I'm a naturopath there, so so uh, you do do all the science work and prepare papers, education, do podcasts every yep. week, and all sorts of things like that. And you know, so and we we, we consult and do in interviews, and I do a thing called Paper of the Week, which is a new scientific paper comes out, and we we'll talk about it. You and know, that's and on the podcast that you got. Yeah, yeah, we do that. So so that's my role there. I it's love AT it. What's your podcast called? Oh, it's the ATP Project. ATP Project. Yeah. Hey, you don't know this, but the guys at ASN, yeah, so they have 37 stores around the country. Yeah, in Australia. Huge. They've said to me, I've got to put my glasses on. You got a vitamin for that? Yeah, astaxanthin. Um, there you go. There you would. 
they have offered 15% off all ATP products. Mm. So if any of the listeners go into an ASN store anywhere uh, within a week, it's only for a week, but it's in a, from within a week of this first going to air. Mm. So if it, you can use this guy, you go in and just quote Guy's Garage over the counter or you can go onto asn.com.au and use that code and check out Guy's Garage. If it doesn't work, it's obviously been more than a week since you... Um, heard the that's podcast awesome, so so yeah that's just on those atp products mate i went in there yesterday and asked the girl about them and they're impressive um impressive range yeah. you've got there so um i think i'm going to need to start taking some stuff I, i'm still training yeah you know, still still doing stuff but i'm not as as dedicated to the training you know i'm not a professional athlete anymore so one what was once three sessions a day for a specific outcome mm. is now just training to feel good mm. you know i've got a three and a half year old daughter um who's gorgeous by the way <laughs> thanks mate <laughs> but uh, you know and a busy wife yeah. i've got a full-time job um that's what now i really have that empathy for guys in that situation and i see the stresses that people go through mm. on a day-to-day basis you know financial pressure and oh, yeah. family commitments and then you know even the last podcast i did with the smoko break guys here in this room actually i had messages come through the next day from a few fellas about you know losses they've suffered in their families from you know loved ones and mm. the stress that they go through and they've just about lose their jobs or you know they're off the rails um it's horrendous you know like so i think probably the main thrust of speaking to you today is just trying to get a simple idea on how and you know what we can put into our bodies and mm. different things that we can do from that you know from that health point of view to reduce some of those stresses mm. yeah and, and we, we can't pay the mortgage off for people or we can't you know help the relationship problems you got but what we can do is reduce the, the stress that the food is giving us yeah. and the, the, the what we eat and what we what we do so if you reduce that burden by eating those those whole foods those vegetable cells you just get rid of that extra cortisol you don't need that you mm. know you need healthy rich foods have the supplements so lots of like so too many carbohydrates oh yeah that's and a big one convert to sugar so in terms of percentages i mean i've i've tried this real low carb diet in the past i mean i'm and i know you've said to me i'm a different you are you're a bit different to the average but i'm, I'm but am i you know like thing is i my number one priority right now is is being healthy yeah and and living well i know I can have a, you know, because I train regularly, I can feel a direct correlation between, and this is probably now starting to talk a bit more about the athletes that might be listening, Mm -hmm. or the really active people, but if I have a low carb day the next day, I don't have that little bit of pep. Mm -hmm. And I often wonder, and I always want to speak to you, and this is my opportunity, uh, you know, where do I, what's that line between becoming a full fat burner low carb diet type person and an endurance athlete and mm. I, I can see how it might work in an ultra endurance state where you don't have any really high intensity mm. um needs or demands on the body yeah. and the muscle contraction you can just keep on t- trucking along i think it makes total sense to me that you tap into your fat burning mm. um my sport i surf life saving and a lot of the stuff i, I do is a little bit shorter range mm. of where it's still an aerobic effort you know it's about three to ten minutes but very high end, high mm. pushing into that anaerobic where I sort of feel like I need more glycogen to burn. So how do I find that happy medium between, you know, replenishing and eating lots of carbs and having that fast reaction muscles being and getting the heart rate up and, and, and eating right? Yeah. Well, for you, you can have more carbs because you're doing that sort of high-end exercise, you know. Uh, the average population aren't doing that, and that, that's the problem. But for someone like yourself, you do need those carbohydrates. So what's the mechanisms happening in my body? If I have more carbs than, mm. than maybe what an average person would have, what's my risk of cancer, though? Uh, if you're burning it off very low. I mean, the, one of the, the best things you can do to reduce cancer is exercise. We know that's potently anti-carcinogenic for a number of reasons. Right. In fact, one of the treatments when I went to America for a cancer conference, they were giving IV, you're going to love this, lactic acid. Now, you know what lactic acid yeah. is? Yeah. Yeah, because the cancer cells are anaerobic. Right. And they, they get the glucose and turn it into lactic acid and they pump the lactic acid out of the cells so they don't die. So... Uh, the old days, if you remember, I don't know, in, in natural medicine, they, they tested cancers and they were acidic. And right. they said, oh, well, acid feeds cancer. I don't right. know if you remember that. Yeah. It was a bit of a myth, myth going around for years because they just said, oh, it's full of cancer. It's full of cancer because it's, it's, it's anaerobically burning sugar. Right. Using yes. lactic acid. Yeah, it's so using they, their sugar as fuel, so the yeah. product is lactic, lactic acid. acid. So they give them IV lactic acid because then the cancer cell couldn't pump out the lactic acid against the, the higher amount so in, in the body. So it couldn't metabolize sugar, so it couldn't grow. Couldn't grow and die. 
Right, it's interesting. So it's a it's a newer chemotherapeutic sort of thing, giving them lactic acid. The other way to give yourself lactic acid is go for a run. Go fast, <laughs> yes. real fast. So so that's a potent anti-carcinogenic way to, to live is to exercise, yeah. and especially going in the sun. You know, vitamin D is potently anti-carcinogenic. Now, too much sun, yeah, myeloma, but yeah. there's a is a risk of being under vitamin D, and that's a huge risk of getting cancer as well, because vitamin D is highly protective against cancer. Right. Being yep. an ideal body weight is a great way to protect against cancer. So a carb eating, fruit loop eating, milk drinking, IT specialist that stays inside out of the sun is probably at high risk of cancer. Well, they are. And and they are for a number of reasons. And, and typically these average Australians, if we call them, because, you know, you and I live in a little bit of a different world, a little mm. bit of a bubble compared mm. to the people out there. But those sort of people that, are, you know, they, they start to put on fat around their weight. And, yeah. they, and I, I had them in the clinic and they'd, they'd, they'd come in for a little spot on their arm like this papilloma here, benign cancer. And they'd, they'd have a gut out here. And I'd go, mm. what about this lump? So what is that barrelly middle that you see? A lot of you know blokes, Aussie blokes in their forties. They got yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. remember remember um, uh, the Hogan, Paul Hogan show. Yes, yes. The, 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 Arthur uh, Dunger. Arthur Dunger. And he'd beat people up with his gut. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, <laughs> they sort of made it that male status symbol. And, it, and even I've noticed in advertising in the last I don't know five years with the with the um, it's kind of cool to be a bit overweight and a bit daggy and yeah. but I mean. Is it? No, because it'll kill you. Um, there's two types of fat in the body. There's what they call visceral fat, and then there's subcutaneous fat. Yep. Subcutaneous fat is the stuff that the girls will complain about because they don't look, you know, the cellulite bits and the bits that hang off. But visceral fat is the fat that sits around your organs here. And what that visceral fat is different to the subcutaneous fat is it's constantly metabolizing. And you might go, well, that's good. You can get rid of it. And you can. However, if it's constantly going through your bloodstream, it's constantly going through the coronary arteries, right. causing damage to the arteries and can clog up your heart. So right. this, this fat is not good. So how do you get the different types of fat? Easy. Um, the visceral fat will build, build up like you're marbling yourself. So if you're having excessive right. carbohydrates and underactivity mm. together, those mm. two things combined, you'll build up the visceral fat. And if you've got high levels of estrogen, like say say you're a woman and you're menstruating, mm. you're breaking down the collagen that's coming out of your uterus every month. Sorry to if, if someone's, you know, it's a bit graphic of people, but that collagen causes the, the lack of estrogen and the high estrogen puts it around your body and around your hips and around your, yep. your waist and that. Yep. So it's very hormonal. Yep. And, and very dangerously, we see now women developing high levels of visceral fat around their tummy. Right. You know, you remember the old days where the girl was like a, an hourglass. Yes. Well, that's hormone, that's estrogen putting fat on those areas if they put on weight at mm. all. And we don't want that. Mm. But it's safer than putting visceral fat on because so it doesn't move. So you refer to as the beer gut. The beer gut. So that's is alcohol a, an issue with visceral fat? Well, it is a little bit, but you've got to remember what comes along with alcohol. If you're a heavy beer drinker, you're typically not an athlete and you're typically eating poorly along with that. And the, of course, the beer is made fermented from sugars. So they're mm. very high in carbohydrates. There are low carbohydrate beers, I know, like pure blondes. So talk to me, I'm, I'm enjoying a beer lately. You know, I'm still, I'm not training as much. I might have a beer, you know, on most days I'll have mm. a beer, which would probably surprise you. Yeah. Um, never drank, yeah. uh, very, you know, very rarely. But um, yeah, like, you know, like everyone, you know, I know in my social circle likes a beer. So, you know, what's too much? What's not, you know, is it, do mm. we need to abstain? No, they don't. There, there's one easy test you can do and you can, you, most people do it every morning. They look in the mirror and they're honest with themselves. Mm. Am I getting a gut? Yeah. And and I, I've had guys saying, I, I, it's actually women about this, when they've, and a couple have come in and they've said, oh, no, my husband, he's really fit. He used to play sport. Yeah. He's, he's great. All he's got is a bit of a gut. Yeah. And it's like, hang on. Yeah. Alarm bells. Yeah. Because that, that... Well, I know I've caught... I, I've definitely put a bit on through the middle. And, you know, I'm probably four or five kilos heavier than what I used to be. And it's all through my middle. And I reckon it's the visual, visceral fat from having some beers. So, mm. you know, for me, it's a couple of beers, you know, five nights a week. Mm. Do I need to cut that back to less or do I need to change my diet? Do I need to drink different things maybe? I don't know. Help, well, help me out here. We, we, we can tell you in a month. So what you do is you measure yourself and measure yourself in a month later. So let's say that you're overweight and you're not. But let's say you are and you say, okay, how's, how's your current diet working out for you? You can find out in a month. You weigh yourself, you measure yourself, tape measures, all this sort of stuff. And, you, you know, I've got, I've got to see a friend who's, who wants to lose some fat. And all I'm taking, I'm not even taking scales. I'm just taking tape measure because mm. this is – anybody can do this. You know, those flexible fabric ones. Yep, yep. And you just measure them and say, okay, how's it gone a month later from what you've done? And if it's reduced, I don't, it doesn't matter how fat they started. And where are you measuring? 
Oh, you measure around the umbilical cord there, or for yep. men, just under the last rib here, so the visceral fat here, where yep. the beer gut grows. We yep. all know where that is. Yep. And you just what about doing it. something like a DXA scan? Like oh, a, DEXA a, scans, yeah. They're, they're pretty re- readily available now. Like, mm-hmm. I, Can you explain the difference between Because I know there's there was that fad there for a while where you go to a gym, you stand on like a scales, and you'd hold on to that bio-impedance thing, but I never really trusted those. But I've been to a DEXA machine, so I can... I mean, you, you want to sure. explain that? Yeah, I did a lot of physics work on that about 20 years ago. Basically, what it does is it passes a current through your body. Now, water conducts electricity. Is this the DEXA one where you lie on the bed or the bioimpedance one? The bioimpedance one works by passing current through your body. Yep. And it can be accurate, but it's not great at measuring how much fat you've got. But what it's good for is measuring how much you've lost or gained. Yep, so you know, as, a, as a benchmark, kind yes. of start and finish. Yeah, and, and they're the, the ones just with scales that you don't hang on to too. They're less accurate because they pass the current up one leg and down the other. Yep, And yep. miss what's happening in your gut. Like the home they, ones that you get. Yeah, and, and they measure changes in leg structure, which is fine yeah. and it's semi-accurate, but mm. you'd rather pass it through your hands as well so you get the visceral fat right. included. And that's the dangerous one. So they're much better. The DEXA scans are much more involved and they look at different compartments of the body. And I know you can get those DEXA scans as a physical science up at Bundle on the mm. Gold Coast. There's places all over the place. QScan have them. So you go in and ask for a, a, a DEXA scan, which is... Explain that. Yeah, body composition analysis. Mm. So basically, the first test you get will be completely and utterly worthless. Is it's what's going to happen in a month's time? Okay. Yes. So if you've if you've lost a kilo of weight and you go, well, that's good, and then you've lost two kilos of muscles and put on a kilo of fat. Yeah. That's where the that's where they're much more accurate. And they ve- measure uh, visceral fat versus subcutaneous, subcutaneous. fat as well. Very much yeah. so. And they're both very very different types of fat. You know, they're, 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 the visceral fat is more what they call brown fat, which is a fat that's got more mitochondria and it's more metabolically active. So that's more dangerous. So it's constantly spewing into your bloodstream. So you really got to watch that. But that's the easiest to get rid of. Right. But the problem is, you know, you, you, you talk to people and you say, all right, I want you to get up and do some exercise. And they go, oh, I'm a night owl. I'm, mm. All the excuses. Mm. And, and, and I, I hate to be the hard ass here, but at the end of the day, they've got excuses or they've got results at the end of the... And, and and if they need motivation, what's what's you know like where you could get you're going to die, you know I mean we're all going to die, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, but but what what we want to do is we, we don't just necessarily want to increase someone's lifespan. We want to increase someone's health span. Does mm. that make sense? Yeah. You know you want to be healthy. Yeah, you don't want to just drop dead one day, have a miserable life getting there. You do, yeah, yeah. You want to you want to die. But then healthy. you know you have people that say to me, oh yeah, we're getting up and training every day. That's that's miserable too. You know, rather just lay in bed. I mean, that's what they think. But, uh, you know, is there a... I know for me, I sometimes don't feel like training. I'm like, oh, it's a bit of a drag. And every single time, I've never never done some exercise and gone, oh, that wasn't worth it. I always mm. feel better afterwards. And I think it's sort of cracking that, changing that thing. Actually, good segue. Look at this. What do you got? ASN gave me this stuff. Ooh. Now, you were talking about supplements before. Yeah. So they gave me this... Um, it's called pyro. You can have a look at this. You're <laughs> yeah. the chemist here. Yeah, you, 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 want, f- you want some motivation? There you go. There's something. Yeah, that's in the, the thing. Like I had some yesterday. I went in the afternoon. I coached, and I was a bit. I'm always a bit tired in the afternoon. A yeah. long day. Get up at four in the morning, and mm-hmm. I got this pyro pro thermogenic, and it's uh, orange. It was actually quite tasty. I put it. I bought some glasses. I think we should have some. <laughs> but I was. Um, I was literally on the beach. Five minutes later, yeah. having a handstand, I coach nippers and surf life saving. Yes, I had yes. the nippers yesterday afternoon, and we were doing handstand competitions. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it was this stuff. So, and, keep to, tell me about. It. I mean, have a little look. Oh, sure. you probably haven't seen this product. Do you want to have a look at no, the ingredients? I yeah, I want to have a look at the ingredients. Typically, they they've got the first ingredient people will hear is L taurine, which is an amino acid that's good for your brain, of course. Right. And you've got beta alanine, which increases blood circulation and buffers against acid build up in your body. Right. So bit, bitter alanine is good for for endurance athletes. So that stuff is that the stuff that makes your face tingle? Because yeah, my face was tingling, <laughs> and apparently that is. It is. It's a side effect. It what is that histamine. happening? I've had it. Releases histamine, and your face it tingles. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's called the beta beta tingles. They beta, call it. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah it, It's harmless. Yeah, and, and but it feels like you've. Um, I know you last a few minutes. Yeah, yeah. It's actually, but but beta alanine uh, buffers against acid buildup. So you know that lactic acid we we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Beta alanine produces uh, binds with another amino acid and causes a buffer called carnosine, which buffers against acid buildup. So it's good. Right. Uh, choline bitartrate is choline is a uh, it helps with your brain neurotransmitters, peps you up. 
Next one, N-acetyl tyrosine. N-acetyl, when you acetylize an amino acid, it gets into the brain. Tyrosine is the precursor to adrenaline. So it right. increases adrenaline in your brain. So okay. no wonder you're doing handstands. <laughs> and caffeine anhydrous, everyone knows caffeine, don't they? Yep. Caffeine blocks adenosine receptors, so it keeps you awake. So I hope you didn't have it too late in the evening, did you? Oh, I had it at uh, five in the afternoon. No, I was off to sleep at 8.30 <laughs> oh, as geez. usual. That was probably half hour after normal. <laughs> oh, cause, cause, Get cause, me up. Yeah, well, caffeine's got a half-life of about three hours. So, th- so I guess the segue to that was, you know, if yeah. people are looking for something to sort of get them pumped up yeah, this and is going it. in the morning, yeah. is that something that, you know, within that, I mean, obviously that wasn't available to the cavemen. No. Hundreds and gatherers. Well, they had mo- extra motivation. Is that, is that something that technology is, is, you know, is that a good thing? Is it a good thing? I mean, you, you, yes and some. no. Yes, it'll make you feel better. Do you, should you need it? You know, but Maybe again, not. look, you, you, I mean, the cavemen had no choice. They had to eat or die. There's no ASN stores in the back there, <laughs> No, no, they had motivation because they needed food. Um, otherwise, they'd starve. They didn't, couldn't get up to have a stretch. That is probably scratch. a good motivator, isn't it? Yeah. Just need food. But see, all those safety, um, well, you know, we've all got safety barriers now. You know, there's always, you don't need to fight for your own food. Let's, uh, let's, go, let's go to town with this. All right. We're That's trying this. Uh, I've got a stirrer here. Huh? Yes. No, there's nothing um, bad, bad in there that, you know, you've just got to be careful of uh, if you've got any hypertension, high blood pressure. Right. Because caffeine increases adrenaline. Adrenaline causes vasoconstriction. And this is how stress kills you, by heart attack. Cheers. Yeah, cheers. I'm going to have some of it. And so it causes um, vasoconstriction. Yeah. There we go. I'll have a whole scoop. Nice. Let's All right. go. Let's see what happens. See if my face tingles. <laughs> it shouldn't. There's only 800 milligrams. So is- something like this, is that something you could take in the morning to go you know everyone gets up and they go I'm, mm. I'm hopeless without a coffee I've got to have mm. a coffee mm. so this has got caffeine in it yeah so could you still and, and you know how do you drink your coffee do you go black I mean I'll, I have cream in my coffee do I need to start like not having dairy Cre- cream's alright because it's uh, the, the bad hormones are, are more in the milk right um, so how does that cha- how does cream and milk differ I would have thought it's the same thing it's the fatty part and so it's a bit more refined and so the the, the fatty part of it doesn't have the IGF-1 the IGF-1 is water soluble hormone right. so it typically hangs around in there the, the other hormones hang around in there so I um, and obviously you have a lot less cream than you would if you had of milk mm. and um, I have cream in my coffee in the morning and um, then that's probably it and I do sometimes I put a dash in if I make scrambled eggs yeah, but that's all right. I mean, you just don't want to be having it uh, like as a big bowl. You, you guys have two liters of milk a day, like oh. young kids that I've been training. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I can't, you know, they just drink it all day long. So that's not oh. obviously that's the other end of the spectrum. It's we, we we fell for that many years ago. Nutritionists about twenty five years ago, and are starting saying that oh, you need calcium for your bones, and you do, but you don't need another animal's milk to have your bones grow. You know, and what's a good good source of calcium? In oh, the nuts diet? and seeds and leafy green vegetables. And uh, it, I know some nuts are not as good as others like peanuts are very carby is that correct mm. they can be it depends on the, the type of peanut and I'm, I'm not sponsored by nobbies but nobbies grow a type of peanut that's high in oleic acid which is omega-9 right. which is the same as olive oil we'll call right. it olive oil called oleic acid so that that nobbies nuts are quite good and, and just going to a men's topic is it the could, old the old ad nibble nobbies nuts <laughs> that's the one that the I don't yeah. know if we could say that it's G rated show yeah, yeah. Um, oh, no I don't think it is but, but if you want to nibble nobbies nuts the, then you have the ones with the skin on it because the skin <laughs> on it contains yeah I know I know it's, good. it's got resveratrol in it which right. is a mild testosterone booster so if you, if you go to the supermarket nuts are expensive so like I'm, I'm looking for an excuse or reason to need to buy them you know you'll see macadamias and like you know 18 bucks mm. a kilo whatever they are 28 bucks a kilo like I won't get those mm. Should we be getting them? Macadamia is extremely high in beneficial fat, so they're good. Um, the nuts have all different categories, like Brazil nuts, for example, if you want to protect against cancer, are very high in selenium. Right. And that's a potent anti-carcinogenic one, uh, shown extremely well for things like prostate cancer, breast cancer, and bladder cancer in mm. particular. Selenium is extraordinarily beneficial because it increases an antioxidant in your body. So that's a good nut to eat. So all the nuts have, they're good. If you get almonds, get the ones with the skin on. Because that's high in polyphenols, which are extremely good for your gut. Right. So there's different nuts. So you when you walk into a shopping centre, I'm assuming you shop at a shopping centre. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> now, I've heard this said before. You you shop in the outer aisles. Yeah. Because a lot of that processed stuff's through the middle there. So is that is that a good tip? Very good tip. Um, make sure you, you you get a lot of coloured stuff. 
um, not just you know that tanny color that's grains you know and and unfortunately Australians are, are terrible eaters when it comes because Westerners are pretty bad anyway and we'll typically have you know the cereal for breakfast and then we may back it up with some believe it or not say a sandwich for lunch mm. with bread mm. and then you might have potato and or have processed meats on that bread yeah of course yeah. you do you know ham and that sort of and this is excluding junk food as mm. we know that we know that's bad and then dinner you might get rice or pasta or noodles but or being something. on the go all the time like you know do you, do you just need to be more organised or yeah. like, um, you know, I'll often find myself in the middle of the day, I'm starving. And, I'm, and actually, that brings me to another question I had for you. Mm. Fasting seems to be a popular option these days. You know, guys going, you know, 22 hours without without eating. It's mm. like, that's that's the same thing when it comes back to wanting to exercise. When I go to exercise, I'm that exhausted. Yeah. <laughs> so I haven't eaten for the last, you know, especially if you train first thing in the morning. Yeah. So, you know what's going on with the body you always hear that oh your metabolism stalled or whatever it may be like is there good things about fasting bad things about fasting there's good and bad i mean sachin panda who's professor panda was a famous uh, scientist he's still around i went to one of his talks a few months ago and he's an advocate of fasting and and the only reason why you'd want to fast is if you need some structure so for example for people who are typically overeating okay what, what i'll tell them to do is try and fast by for example, uh, eating at, say if you can, 5.30, 6 o'clock in the evening and then not eating all night and in your sleep, of course, from mm. 9 or 10 till whatever. And then you get up and exercise. So you're stretching that fast so you say out. It, should you always exercise before you eat in the morning? It's typically the best way time to exercise. You'll burn more fat, twice as much as fat. Because there's no ready sugar in the body to Exactly. Burn, yeah. And it's the way that the human body's evolved and the cortisol levels are, are spiked. So the, the caveman would have to get up and go hunt or yeah. gather food. Yeah, he's not going to get up and have a bowl of cereal and a cup of coffee, then go. Exactly, he can't just knock on the fridge and open it up in the cave and go. So, so it's good to eat. Just have a big glass of water. Are we cheating if we have like a pyro or a coffee before Py- we go? Pyros are right now. The, the, the only problem with with the, uh, having this is because it, it tasted sweet. It's possibly got a sweetener in it. I would have. I don't know which one, but the sweetness can increase insulin release, so it stalls fat loss a little bit. That's so an interesting. I explained this to someone, and this was thanks to your knowledge. Oh, okay. Can you explain that insulin and and um, how it insulin? You know, you, I remember you explaining to me how f- insulin is released by sugar hmm. when you eat sugar, and it's released to bring that sugar level back back down. But how it insulates fat fat burning? Can you explain yeah, that sure. system? Insulin is a hormone that acts on the cells to allow sugar to go into the cells. So insulin is released from a pancreas in your body and it knocks on the, the door of the cell and sugar goes in. The glucose 4 transporters so it, in the it muscle. it transports the sugar yeah. into the cell? It, 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 it tells the glucose 4 transporters, which are sugar transporters, to take sugar into the cell to be burned as energy. Now, while you're burning that, guess what you're not burning? Fat. Yeah. So if you eat before you want to burn fat, then you're going to release insulin, even mm-hmm. if it's just... Um, you know, proteins or carbohydrates, release that. And so you will stall fat loss. So if your goal is fat loss, then you don't want to eat before you exercise. And it's because insulin's released. There is a... Well, let's face it, most of us would be trying to lose a bit of weight. Would be a fat. With exercise, there's, a, there's that small percentage of population that are training for, a, for a, an outcome or a specific mm. sport. But even they probably want to lose a bit of fat. So... Mm. So we don't want to go in and have it. So where's that mechanism? There's a mechanism, you know, the likes of an Endura sports drink mm. or a Gatorade or whatever mm. where you can have carbs. You see triathletes having the gel packets when they're exercising. Mm. Now, where's that window of – I know there is a window when you start to exercise where the system changes a little and the sugar goes straight into the muscles. You know your stuff. There's a, there's a chemical release when you exercise called adenosine monophosphate kinase which is um our amp k we will simply or, or five amp is another way and what that does is that allows glucose to go into the cells independent of insulin right so it doesn't require insulin so while you're exercising and you have sugars it still will stall fat loss because so what's considered what would the body need how much exercise and how long would it need to be exercising before this starts to happen about 30 minutes Right. So if you are only got 30 minutes of exercise, try not to eat. A lot of those companies recommend, oh, smash smash a gel and a drink before, 15 minutes before you start the race. And I always wonder, you know, like, am I going into that race completely blocking my body of, of fat burning potential? Yeah, and, and there is, there's a reason why they say it's to sell the product and, yeah. and make no mistake. And, and if your event is a three to 10 minute event, you could do that. Yeah, right, because you, you're tapping it, that's all you're burning, it's yeah. instant sugar. But, you know, a few years ago I did the marathon and, um, you know, 
That was fun. We don't and start on a gut full of sugar, right? Never, no. But during the race, about two hours after the race, I, there was some gels there and I had that during the race. Right. But not at the start. Yeah. And, you so know, you want to be exercising for about 30 minutes and then it's going to go straight into your bloodstream and be more yeah. effective and not release the insulin. Oh, yeah. And plus, you know, you, you, there's other things you can do before you exercise to, you know, some ergonomic aids like the ones in these and even more advanced ones that you give yourself, uh, you know, like... You, you can you can take to improve your performance without um you know putting any in yourself in danger because mm. you see that a lot you see you know mums and dads especially with the young kids and that they send them off to school after school sport and they're like have a you know have something to eat before you go mm. and um and i've ha- i've in the 90s so when i was professional athlete it was all about carbs how mm. many carbs you had you know have you had enough carbs and um more very often did I have that I had that sugar wall you know people talk about hitting the wall mm. and you have that sugar bonk and you're lightheaded and you, you sort of feel like you can't go on and, and you, you get cravings for food mm. um, and then it wasn't until later in my career where I started reading more about and talking mm. more with you about stuff that I'd, I'd go and I had to and it was quite a process to adapt my body to accessing fat going mm. for long bike rides for two and three and four five hours yeah. and really training your body to start to metabolize these fats but there was a time where it was very difficult because i just kept filling my body with sugar and mm. my body was just burning the available sugar that was there and i'd get that wall and mm. i'm sure that sounds familiar to a lot of people and and probably on a daily basis just people going to work they're just constantly picking up sugary stuff you know just the other day my wife was talking about a friend she was on a health kick they made all these healthy muffins you know and they were eating flowery muffins okay. thinking that they were on a health kick you know yeah. and you know what's happening in the body and if someone does that you know they think oh i've made these homemade muffins they're all flour mm. what, you know what what are they doing to themselves well they're they're giving themselves and, and, and let's say and i'll benefit the doubt let's say it's a low glycemic index have you heard of that yeah. the gi thing that means it's turned into sugar in the body slowly that's right. what that means the rate of turned glucose so let's say you have a low GI muffin okay so and let's how, assume how's a low GI muffin what's, what is a low GI muffin versus a high, high GI, GI muffin okay high GI muffin maybe have just normal wheat flour very very like you know refined yeah. yeah but this might have drum wheat which is a lower GI it turns into or have oats which is a very low GI yeah and you might sweeten it with honey which is a lot of fructose yeah uh, this one which is again fructose is a GI of 20 so it turns into glucose very slowly, even though molecularly they're quite similar. That just takes a long time to turn there. This might have just sugar mm-hmm. and white flour. But let's say that we've gone this way, which is what we typically think is healthy. That means it turns into sugar slowly over the next four to six hours. Guess what you're not going to burn for four to six hours? Fat. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you explained this to me once before about the difference between complex carbohydrates and simple carbohydrates. Mm-hmm. And it was just simply the formula on the wall when you wrote it out. It one was it's long, and one was short. But at the end of the day, they all turn into sugar. Sugar, C six H twelve O six glucose. It it all ends up as that. And yeah. so the body needs to process it. So the slow release sugars, these beneficial low GI stuff, is just slowly releasing yeah. insulin throughout the body all day long. All day long, so especially you, if you have oats for breakfast. Yeah, yeah, right. And a lot of people do. And so you know, typically people will get up, have a bowl of muesli, mm. a cup of coffee. Mm-hmm and some milk in it and then they'll go to work and they'll have another cup of coffee and then someone will say oh who wants a muffin or a piece of toast or you know and then lunch is whatever's going bread whole grain bread then, even then yeah. they're like oh well feel a bit stodgy in the afternoon need a snack have a snickers bar and then i'll go to dinner for have a bowl of pasta <laughs> so what a train wreck it's just a train wreck isn't it it is it's it and also while you're eating all that flowery stuff you're not eating all the foods that you should be eating fruits salads nuts seeds legumes meats fish these sort of things if you have if you're filling up with flour you're not filling up with that stuff and people say oh but i had some salad salad with dinner Mm. and it's like gee you should be eating bulk of this stuff you know we didn't hunt down and kill a bowl of wheat we didn't eat from a pasta plant or a bread tree Mm. you know it's 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 ridiculous we didn't run around and suck on a cow's udder yeah 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 so you just go back to basics and i mean it's going to be you got to be a little bit more organized and sh- maybe it's a little bit more expensive but i mean you can't put a price on health right well and plus um you know people say to me oh, i don't want to live like that or eat like that i said look i didn't design the human body hmm. i didn't say this if i designed the human body i'd say eat what you want and you'll so live forever the the food pyramid that you yeah. and a dietitian is still teaching that you know is that outdated mm. of course it is it's a train wreck another one um you know unfortunately um the food pyramid 1989 was put together by a grain board and adopted by uh, um some some of the heart foundations and the, the biggest part of its grains six to eleven serves was funny? the old school and then it went to four to six 
six and you're still way over the top of that. I mean, who eats six to 11 servings of flour a day? Mm. It's, it's, it's bad anyway, one serving a day. But a lot of, if you tried to eat six to 11 servings a day, like the old recommendation was, I mean, what a terrible idea that is. Mm. I mean, the Heart Foundation, you know, is on the wrong side of history in this one. And we fought against it, you know, going back in the 90s, of course, because that, I mean, and it's easy. You, you could argue you could have lots of flour like, aha, it's full of carbohydrates. That means you've got a lot of energy. You know, you, you were taught the same sort mm. of thing. Mm. Now, how do you feel after you eat a big bowl of pasta? You're always tired. Meta- yeah. Because your thyroid's depressed. Yeah. So those people are going to, A, that's all going to be turned to chill because you're not mm-hmm. going to go for a marathon run afterwards. Mm-hmm. And B, you're going to suppress your thyroid and feel tired. So you're not going to want to exercise. Right. And it's, a, it's, it's just terrible news for the, for the body. Mm-hmm. All that sugar too. Yeah, more fish. Actually, one of our, one of our supporting sponsors is Charis uh, Seafood Wholesale. Nice. So perfect. Yeah. Great, a great segue, you know, go and eat more fish, get out to those seafood restaurants and, yeah, I, and order that stuff. So, so uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting one and that it just makes me wonder how in today's society we went down that road of, you know, it's just fast food convenience factor, mm. you know, and it's all just feeding down that same sort of line of just feeling like crap. And I, I mean, I'm guilty of it. I've, I know better and I exercise and I, I know I can just take the easy options. Mm. Um, what about kids? Like, mm. so at a three and a half year old and we, and we try and just get as anything we can get into her but she eats pretty good but you know like we don't stop her eating some crap and some carbs and stuff like that they they've got to be in my mind they're no different to us they're just little versions of it mm. obviously there's things that you can't feed them um so yeah has you got got some advice there kids are different because the fat that they make is called bat or brown adipose tissue now why is that important that's because brown color means it's got more mitochondria so they're much l- more resistant to put on body fat and secondly, they're growing, so they'll use so a lot more what, calories. And what age do you ca- categorize this brown fat stuff? Like, when does that start to run out? It runs out about the age of twelve, right? And yeah. So, how do how do little kids? You see obese little kids? Oh, they have What's to struggle happening? to What's get up. Yeah, I know it's train wreck. They they have to eat really badly for a long period of time and drink really badly. You got to remember that. Yes, they they might eat McDonald's, but they'll have Coke with it. Yeah, and and, and the orange juice is a big one. Orange juice is about you know fifteen percent sugar too. So, what do they drink? Well, they're just water. It'd be great, wouldn't it? But but they, they typically don't because yep. they, they're having calories all the time. And to really force a child to becoming overweight is actually a difficult experiment to do. Right. And it takes years because kids are very resistant to becoming overweight. Right. So that's why there's less of them overweight than there are I just feel adults. sad. I see young kids that are overweight already. You know, what kind of a life have they got? I saw a, a fellow mm. who was, must have been in his late teens and he was, you know, morbidly obese. And he looked sad. Mm. And like I actually was sitting there opposite him at a waiting room, and I just I just wanted to reach out and say I want to help him. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I was I was actually thinking about the questions I was going to ask you today, mm. hoping that one day this kid might hear something like it. Yeah. You know, he just looked unhappy to me. I mean, I, I, it, may, it could have been all sorts of things going on in his life. I don't know, but mm. like, I'm like, I'm just making a ju- you know blanket yeah. judgment here that it's his weight that's getting you down. But surely, if you're not overweight that's one less problem in your life that you have to worry about it's one all right physically it's very bad for you we can talk for hours about that but also psychologically unfortunately if you're overweight you get picked on and that's not good and that's terrible but that's what reality is so yeah. you know that's another reason what about mood i mean depression and my sister w- took her own life yeah. um five years ago going on six years now and yeah. she she suffered with depression over the years yeah. and she used to be an athlete a swimmer got out of it a little bit and had other other pressures and she was a little bit overweight is there foods that we can avoid to you know to help our moods sure uh sugar is a bad one <laughs> because yeah well sugar is not good is it <laughs> no it's not it's not and and, and and have you ever heard of the term comfort food yes right now when you eat comfort food and that's usually the stodgy carbohydrate yeah, rich, ice cream and yeah yeah it makes you feel better and and the, i'll give you a bit of biochemistry it yeah, ties yeah, with why does it make me feel better yeah good because when you eat sugar sugar releases insulin and insulin binds with another hormone called growth hormone and forms insulin like growth factor one and what it does that that hormone pumps amino acids and pushes them into your muscles to build muscle. IGF-1 is insulin-like growth factor 1, so it grows muscles. And you might be thinking, well, what's bad about that? Mm. Well, all the amino acids go into your muscles, and there's some that don't go into muscles, and one of them is tryptophan. And the amino acid tryptophan is therefore in relatively higher concentrations in the blood after you eat sugars, right? So tryptophan is the building block to guess what a neurotransmitter in your brain? Serotonin. Right. So you end up with a flood of serotonin in your brain. 
and you feel great. And there's still not a reason why it's the so comfort bad. Food, yeah. It's the comfort food. But guess what you become addicted to? That good feeling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you might have seen the movie with the 16-year-old girl who breaks up with the 16 year old boy and and she comes home and eats ice cream mm. and that'll make you feel better mm. that's the mechanism of action that vicious cycle as vicious cycle. fat bastard would say on yeah exactly and Austin Powers. and so therefore that that's what that's a quite a bad thing because yeah. that's a positive reinforcement of a bad food mm-hmm. i mean exercise makes you feel good too and that's a positive reinforcement yeah, so what are the chemical reactions happening there you know people talking about endorphins yeah endorphins endorphins are things that are natural painkillers that your body releases because exercise is painful isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. You, know, you should have seen me doing lap pull downs and chin ups it was painful yeah, but yeah. my body says right, okay it's pain let's try and numb that and so you release endorphins yeah. and then of course I jump off the so a lot of people give up before they get to that yeah so is there a like a typical time frame that where that endorphin release starts to happen it does and that's when the pain becomes quite intense so unfortunately to get that that what they call runner's high have you ever heard of that one mm. that's endorphins and brain derived neurotrophic factor and that kicks in about 160 beats per minute heart rate oh, right. yeah or when you've gone to failure when your muscles have failed okay. and they usually fail because of pain and they run out of ATP or energy in is the it 160 cells? beats per minute is yeah. it like generic I mean obviously the older you get does that become a little lower well it doesn't well, unfortunately 160 for me that's pretty high for me these days yeah well you've got to be 220 minus your age yep. so you know that's you know that that's your maximum heart yeah, rate so yeah, yeah. for me my maximum heart rate's 170 yeah so, so, so you still got to get up to that nearly 90% plus you do but, but there is another way to get endorphins and that is to enjoy and, and and have a different attitude towards exercise because you know trying to educate tell people to exercise they go oh, i don't like it or whatever typically not you and i but mm. don't like it and so what you've got to do is you try and get people into a, a mindset where they enjoy the exercise and that is that releases other hormones like oxytocin the love hormone and mm. all these other things that gives you that high so you can do that and you the still, love hormone explain that one to me oh uh, oxytocin is the love hormone you know, so like when you fall in love, is oxytocin. Is it the shagging hormone? Or yes, is it just it's the shag- <laughs> when, when, you, when you orgasm, you release oxytocin. Right. And that's what bonds the, the partners together. Yeah, yeah. You know what so I mean? when you get married, there's no more. No uh, more oxytocin. <laughs> no. Right. Hey, hey, Beck, just a shout out to my wife. <laughs> we're uh, we're yeah, really wrapping yeah, on marriage yeah, at the moment. Yeah. Uh, and, and oxytocin is another great thing to grow grow your muscles too. Yeah, right. So there's, there's a lot of... Um, there was a funny quote from uh, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger in his book about you know, if, if like getting the pump is like having an orgasm, I'm constantly orgasming, like that's the, yeah. it's the same. Is there a correlation there chemically is. for that? Yeah, yeah, oxytocin is released. So that's it. It is yeah, yeah, absolutely, and and oxytocin is that um, falling in love with yourself. And I'm not meaning like you know an ego thing, but yeah. a lot of people hate themselves. You know, yeah. they look at the mirror yeah. and go, "Oh my yeah. god, I'm so fat," yeah. and do nothing about it. Yeah. But if you can, in, you know, embrace the the pain and all that and you hear those those you know like Arnold and those sort of people mm. say those sorts of things and that's that's how you really enjoy exercise mm. you find a you, you don't do it to punish yourself you do it to it's an interesting improve. thing because you know you know certain parts of the community look at guys that are fit or girls that are fit and they go oh they're on themselves or they're all about themselves mm. obviously there's a fine line between obsessing mm. and going too far that way but then you know, you do need to have a certain amount of self-respect and fitness and take care of yourself because if you're out of nick or you're, sh- you're, you get cancer and die, who's mm. going to look after your family? So mm. I guess there's, there needs to be a certain amount of that sort of like let's let's take care of ourselves. It's okay to one, look after yourself. It's okay to talk about your issues. Mm. Um, you know, like the big thing with guys is they don't talk about stuff. And oh. they, they always put everyone else first. Um mm. You know, when they start to do a little bit of stuff for themselves, they get judged or they feel like they might be judged. So, you know, there's all of that, which also brings in... I mean, I've had anxiety over the last little while with the pressures, you know, between my sister and my dad Mm -hmm. dying and then, you know, feeling like I'm the one that's sort of left to sort of look after the family. And, and, um, you know, what's a tip on dealing with those sort of anxieties? It's tricky, uh, man, because there's some real anxieties like you've mentioned there, which you can't, you know dismiss yep so what there are certain and i'll I'll use the medications but not not prescription medications there's herbs and that sort of thing that can help you cope with anxiety from the 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 situation now there's there's many companies we we have one called quadrx which normalizes cortisol so it won't fix the problems but it helps your physiology cope with the stress Mm. and so there's those sorts of things the last thing you want to go down to in my opinion is you know unless your doctor prescribes it but try not to seek out the 
uh, prescription anti anti mm. um, psychotics like uh, you know like, like any of the benzos right. for example. The yeah, to me, like do, you know, doing the prescription stuff would be I would never go down that road. You know, it's I'd very just, common. Yeah, you know, everyone's on, um, you know, Valium or, or Zantac. So what are this? What are the bad? You know, is there bad side effects to doing that? As you know, I I'd never trust. I don't trust pharmaceuticals. And, <laughs> you know, like, you know. no, there there is bad because they they're very addictive. And so you become reliant on them. Mm -hmm. And um, if you go off them, they can have withdrawal symptoms. So, you know, the Valium will set you down. You know, it'll, it'll, it'll relax you. Short term might be a good thing, you know. Um, but if you become addicted to those, then mm -hmm. they're very, very problematic. Mm -hmm. And one of the major problems in America now is the opioid em epidemic. Have you heard of that? Yes. Yeah, opioids yes. Are, are very powerful painkillers. And oxycontin sort of stuff. Oxycontin, yeah. uh, 1994, that was released, and that was a the one that was non-addictive for your right. brain, and they found out it was, and, yeah. and Johnson Johnson got sued $2 billion for that misleading claim. So they're highly addictive, and when you go off them, it causes massive side effects, and of course, if you overdose on opioids, you so die. So where does cannabis, you know, and this legalization of cannabis and that stuff come into all of this bigger picture? Well, it's it's interesting one because cannabis does work on the brain and it does sedate the brain, um, but we don't know enough about it yet to whether it's important to, you know, whether it's going to cause addiction and that sort of thing. We know the benzos do, so we've got to be careful of those. Um, and we've, we know the opioids are very addictive. We've got to be careful of those. These, these, you know, THC and those sort of ones are under prescription in Australia now, so they are sort of trialling them. We don't know how addictive they are, but my, you know, from a naturopathic point of view, we, we shouldn't be depending on those medicines. I mean, it's okay to take them short term, you know, for a day or two if you need to, you know, like I, I flew to America recently um, for a medical conference, not for anything exciting. And, you know, it's come back to get out of jet lag. I took a sleeping tablet to get over the jet lag mm. that's fine mm. but if you need to take sleeping tablets every night sleep or anti you know it's another overlying or underlying absolutely problem. so so that's the problem with those so yeah there is a trust issue with those and you should have you know question those because what we want to do is give the individual enough strength to carry on without any herbal or mm. otherwise mm. so you can actually you know improve your own health so really the, I guess the message is like we really just need to go back to basics and keep it simple yep um, you know my, my biggest thing is like you know how you know day to day rushing around you know I guess it just mm. comes back to being organised and, and, and trying to eat, eat the right yeah. it's really what you put in yeah. you just got to think about what's going in and, and keeping it keeping it simple keeping away from the processed stuff keeping yes. away, keep away from the sugars the carbs it's everywhere you turn it's just <laughs> carbohydrates they're cheap they taste good yeah. um, everyone loves them and, and what like about filling feeling that so you know satiated you know, like I, I often feel like I haven't had enough to eat when I have a big big salad and a steak yeah do I just need to go bigger <laughs> well you can or you can you can have your um, say uh, what they could healthy carbohydrates so for example a classic one that fills you up is like the yams right the sweet potatoes oh, sweet potatoes yeah. uh, and they're a, a sort of a cross mix between the grains which are highly refined mm. and still having carbohydrates which fills you up right and it also swells in your stomach because they're high in soluble fibers it makes you feel a bit more yeah full. so yeah. if you have a big steak and a lot of sweet potatoes like i had for dinner like, oh, I, had, no, I had fish last night but but you have them and you don't feel like eating afterwards and remember if you if you can fast through till after exercise in the morning you fasted for about say 14 hours mm. um and you eat breakfast a bit later then that's actually a very healthy way so to get through. So if you were, okay, I'm probably get, getting a little off topic with that. We have athletes, which sh should they do their more aerobic, longer training sort of sessions in the morning and then yeah. their harder stuff in the afternoon perhaps? Yeah, we do. We, we recommend that because um, the, the, the endurance exercise in the morning will train the body to burn fat. Mm. And you won't run fast, you won't, you won't perform as well as you would if you're on sugar. Yeah. But it, it upregulates those fat-burning enzymes. So if you're, there's a lot of guys doing, you know, you see the high-intensity workout programs and stuff like that so they're going to be better off doing those classes in the evening yeah absolutely yeah. it may be in the afternoon the evening you can release cortisol which may keep you up at night right. but if you're not prone to that not too so, late yeah so in the morning there, there are supplements like these you can take like uh, carnitine mm. now carnitine increases an enzyme in the body called carnitol palmitol transferase sorry about the big words yeah <laughs> don't write that down yeah. uh, and, and that enzyme shuttles fat into the mitochondria so you can have a spoonful of that before you exercise right. and that's what I do yeah cool well, mate, um, I've got some. Yeah, I mean, we could talk for hours, and we have. <laughs> I think done we have, have we? <laughs> but I, um, yeah, let me just. I just want to recap that ASN. You go onto uh, asn.com.au, drop in guys garage code. It'll work for seven days after this is published. If it's not working, obviously it's 
down the track you've missed the window but yeah, you can get 15 percent off with that code on atp products which mm. is the, the company you work for mm -hmm. um some really good stuff there also go into the stores you can get those discounts as well this just drop guys garage over the counter um that doesn't work in conjunction with any other sales there's some stuff coming out at the end of end of the month as sure. well so uh yeah so that's a great offer from asn um just want to recap it's a bloke thing is the charity that we're, we're sort of helping get that awareness mm. out there they, they're encouraging guys to go and get the psa so that's that prostate specific antigen test yes, so yes. you'd probably be able to explain a little more about sure. how, what that actually means yeah there, there's antigens if you've got prostatic cancer your body releases antibodies or antigens to that particular cancer mm. and you can detect them in a blood test this blood test psa because everyone's like, oh yeah you know the jokes about getting the finger test mm. that's not the first line of defense no it's not because that's for hypertrophic uh which is which can be bph which is benign prostatic right. hypertrophy which is enlarging of the prostate gland which happens uh, depending on how old you are this is that we when the exams if you're 60 years old you've got a 60 percent chance of having some enlargement 70 70 percent so it's quite common so the stats are um you know like most men in older age are living with some sort of prostate cancer but yeah. they won't necessarily die from it so it's not something we need to freak out about no. but but seeing an elevated psa level or a fast change it, there is stuff that you can do Oh, to yeah. defend against you know dying of prostate related so my dad had it and then it got out of his prostate into his bones mm. and, and and it's a nasty way to go so mm. you know you don't have to go like that there's plenty of good treatments and the yes. first line of defense is just to get that psa level to, PSA to, test. So just gp yep gp blood test every male should have it about every year or two um, so after 40 they say oh, after 50 they're saying but i mean obviously with family history just ask around i think mm. if you ask your family if there's anyone in that extended family males that have had it mm. i'd go sooner rather than later just get oh, that yeah. number and um yeah just i've got a little hashtag actually use psa so the prostate specific antigen test psa okay oh. and we then you put so i've got a photo i took and when i got my test done after dad Saw died that, yeah. yeah and it was 0.64 which is nice should and low be, should be below one and i'd had it previously and it was um point five or something it hadn't elevated much no, so all i did was psa okay hashtag with my full name afterwards mm. and in the text of the message that i put on instagram i put my result mm. and then i'm able to just click back on that hashtag at any point and go oh yeah that was the 23rd of june 2017 yeah and then i know the number so it's a really simple way to keep a track of it obviously your gp keeps track of it for you but it's just mm. good to know so you can have a quick reference Oh, it's, it's so important. I mean, that, that that's one of the things that all men should should get get checked as mm. part of their. The so stats so are amazing. It's three and a half thousand. I've got an email. For, uh, so we we I work with some of the guys from um, Prostate uh, Cancer Council, and and they sent me through the stats, and it's something like three and a half thousand men. If we can pull up the email. A year die yeah. in Australia alone, of prostate cancer. So it's it's ten a day. It's if you want some stats, ten a day. Ten a day. And and you got to admit you're right. The prostate is not a gland that you need. The prostate is a, a donut shaped gland, and you and if I use this straw <laughs> on camera, the urethra passes through there. So if you get if hypertrophy, it does squeeze it off. So if you have problems urinating at night, yep, you know, and you you can't. So you can have an enlarged prostate and not have cancer. Correct. Right? It's so because like, I've had the same thing, trouble urinating, and my mm. mates because my dad are like, oh, you know, you're gonna better get that checked. You know, you know what oh, they're saying. You get it checked, but. No, that's when you put the finger mm. and what causes the enlarged prostate with lots of things but typically age and being obese yep because as you age there's an enzyme in your body that upregulates, and i don't want to get too biochemical but it's called aromatase and it takes your healthy testosterone and turns it into estradiol right and that is estrogen that yep. you find in women and that can cause prostatic enlargement okay and prostatic cancers and all sorts of three things. and a half thousand men die of prostate cancer each year Ugh. more men die of prostate cancer than women die of breast cancer yeah, 20,000 men a year receive a new diagnosis it's mm. estimated that 200,000 men currently living with prostate cancer in Australia it's incredible isn't it yeah, so you know, that's 10% you know that's, that's a, well, you know, not 10% but it's a huge a amount lot. of the population yeah. and you know simple and, but the, the interesting thing is there and there are a lot of guys go ah oh, it doesn't matter I even met a guy um, at surf club a few weeks ago he said ah, doesn't matter my wife left me my kids are growing up no one gives a shit <laughs> oh, but I'll tell you mate oh. if, if he had a sat with me mm. holding my dad's hand when he passed away painful bone cancer mm. 
he would not say that. No. Because uh, he doesn't have to die that way. No, you <laughs> choose don't. die something else, I mate. mean, that's the most common. You've got to remember, prostate cancer itself doesn't, you know, the prostate's not essential, but yeah. it does metastasize or spread, and that's when. Yeah. That's like breast cancer. So that's it's not something cancer. we need to be, sto- st- you know, stoic about. No. And we just, just get it checked, stay on top of that stuff. You know, like I've, I've just went and got a skin cancer check, first one I've ever done. I've, I you? worked on. Yes. Really? Can you believe it? I worked on the beach my whole life yeah. and I you know and I, and I haven't had it done because you just don't go to the doctor and um, I was all good I don't know how <laughs> but um, and uh, you know and I know after 50 the, the government sends out the bowel cancer check thing I've like had I'm, mine checked yeah I'm thinking well, I'm 49 I just want to get it done now I just want to rule everything out yeah. you know so oh, I'd rather know the answer mm. and, and I've seen too many people just sort of push it aside and then it's too late oh it's I mean, you got to remember that bowel cancer is eminently treatable. So is prostatic cancer. Yeah. I mean, there's powerful drugs nowadays, uh, GNRH inhibitors, which which basically you know block all hormone production in the body. So that's that, there's there's those sort of drugs. There's all sorts of treatments for prostatic mm-hmm. cancers, natural ones. There's turmeric is potently anti-carcinogenic. There's a lot of turmeric stuff going around research. There and is stuff, it yeah. there. Anti-inflammatory benefits and it's it's got that side effect where it helps your joints and that sort of thing, mm. and um, it does so many wonderful things for the body. I've got to ask you before you go. I mean, just rewind a little bit. I see, so the estrogen testosterone balance thing, and I see men with beer guts, and I know there's a link back with estrogen levels, and and I always make this joke. It's probably wrong, wrong, but you, know, you see the trucky with the beer gut who rescued the guy in the flood, and, he, and he's just that little bit. I don't know there's something not right there and they they break down and have a cry on tv and it's a very emotional rescue and and i always think to myself is that his estrogen levels playing you know like a serious question even though it's a bit of a sort of dark comedy joke kind of rap on it but i know there's some something there because i've spoken to you about this in the past can you explain sure all of that well there's, there's an enzyme that you find a lot in women's ovaries and it's called aromatase and what it does is it takes testosterone and turns it into estradiol, which turns it into the other two estrogens. So it turns testosterone into estrogen. It's called estradiol. Men have little activity of that, but fat cells are high in aromatase. Right. So if you're fat and you've got too much visceral fat, then you do make a lot of estrogen. And you see guys with, and I'll just call it man boobs. Yep. Um, that's the estrogen, and that's a very dangerous thing for those men to have men man boobs. You know, yeah, it looks whatever. I don't care about that. I'm a scientist. It's it's a health problem. So what's dangerous about that? Oh, well, it's bad for receptors in your body like prostate and those sort of things, and men are not designed to have high levels of estrogen. Right. And it can cause cancers in men uh, dramatically. So visually, man boobs, what are those signs that you might well, be getting impotence, dangerous levels? Right. Uh, high fat levels. Um, and also you, you, you react to certain situations differently. Like, you know, they, they become very anxious and very stressed because testosterone uh, it, it gives you that, that sort of strength and that sort of, mm. you know, that, that thing that, that men probably too much on, but it, it is the thing that gives you your soundness of the mind. You know, mm. it gives you confidence, gives you, you know, all those sorts of, gives you your libido. If your libido is flagging and you're, you're tired and you're not coping with life. I mean, I'm not sexist in any way and I love women and there's so many strong women for their own mm. their own reasons but men and women are different they are and they're, uh, and they're supposed to be <laughs> they are supposed to be I mean you know I know I know that we're in a, a modern culture it's 2019 and we have you know women can do anything man can do and all that sort of thing but we are different and we're designed to be different and we have different you know can we, we, you know, we've, we've got Y chromosomes women don't you know yeah. and that's a completely different thing do you think you know that this like gender stuff that's going on now do you think some of this confusion is if we rewind if it was is it diet related well yeah the, the high estrogen you know, in, in men is you're talking about all these different hormones and different things and people not you know having this identity crisis are they because you know have they just gone are we just adapting to this one sex kind of generation <laughs> I think some of it's that. I mean, there's some genuine people who are transsexuals and sure. those sort of things, and there's diseases called uh, Turner syndrome, which have XXY chromosomes. So there's, there's certainly those sort of yep. uh, disorders. But you're right. There is a, a social pressure for men to be more like women, mm-hmm. and there is a social pressure for women to sometimes be more like 
men mm. and they are different and they have different roles and you know in, in, in a free society you see men that choose this sort of you know way of of, of, of life so you see women that in a free society to go this way mm. there, there's been social experiments where they've said for example okay we need more women engineers in in study i read recently and so they they lowered the 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 in, intake scores for the women and they weren't happy mm. um so there's studies where you know, in a, in a, in an in ideal environment, that that men do choose different professions. I mean, you know, we, we don't want equality of outcomes weirdly because equality of outcomes means that, for example, three out of you know out of the four suicides in Australia, three of them are men. You know, and the biggest cause of death between the age of fifteen and forty four is suicide in men. Horrendous figures. Mm-hmm. You know, so so there is a lot of pressure on men in that area, and there's a lot of pressure on women to, for example, they they may want to become mothers, but they want a mm. career too yep, yeah. and it would be wonderful in an ideal world to have both mm. um, and this is what would be great but it doesn't seem to work out it's a out complex like web it's of the com- you know, society today isn't it that we're tricky. Just throwing ourselves into a and, and it's improved a lot because yeah. you know women should have equal rights and equal Absolutely. choice yeah. but um, you know there is a lot of pressure social pressures which mm. causes a lot of problems in, in men and women Yeah, yeah. you see it every day and, and you know I don't personally care either way I, I want e- equality of, of um, opportunities for yeah. men and women yeah but I, from a health professional, I don't like seeing the health implications of these pressures that are associated. Mm, mm. It's quite scary. Mate, great to have you in. I was very I excited, it. very privileged to have you in as my first guest. Oh, we're going to get some great guests. Um, the next one, uh, we, we've got actually got a another friend, mutual friend of ours, uh, Nick Barker, who's mm. a ex SAS soldier. What a nice guy too. Yeah, and he's he's um, he's going to talk about mental toughness, and he's also. Uh, had his share of PTSD mm. situations so we want to talk about that and um, yeah it's going to be really interesting so a um, couple other guys lined up down the track we're, I won't go into it right now but yeah we've got some really exciting stuff in the in the, uh, in the the works so Guys Garage um, hope you enjoyed it uh, share it around if you're listening to all your friends and you know we're out there trying to make a, a difference to the men out there and their families so uh, thanks very much mate thanks Steve no worries it's great to be here thank you very much Cheers, mate.